Welcome to Super User TV. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what you do? David Flanders, OpenStack Foundation Community Wrangler, but specifically for application developers and also uh, this up and coming research community, though we're obviously talking about AppDiv. I'm looking forward to hearing about that. Yeah, we should have, we should have a talk about that. Yeah, so I'm Craig Peters, I'm a product manager at Mirantis, and I worry about the application developer experience also. Coincidence, it's a good thing we're both here. How did that happen? <laughs> And who are you? <laughs> Pleasure. So uh, tell me something. What what applications do you think benefit most from app, from OpenStack? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Uh, so the natural answer is web native apps, right? I mean, essentially, when you design an application that's built from the ground up to take advantage of the flexibility you get out of the infrastructure, but also not assume availability of virtual machines or even network then you're going to get the most bang for your buck. But that being said, you know, one major area of effort right now in OpenStack is to make sure that you can bridge uh, to more legacy style applications and enable uh, connectivity to existing infrastructure, but also onboard some of those uh, services into OpenStack as well. Yeah, totes, it's that, kind of that extreme. Web scale I'm really interested in. You know, uh, great, one of the clients is uh, doing, it provides customer service on Twitter, right? So every time a customer asks a question on Twitter and says, at whatever, they scrape that. So them being able to do that globally and build their own service for that is a really great example of that kind of web scale application. Right, but you're, you're tying in the, the sort of older style of getting the data and bringing it into the new world. Yep, yeah. bingo. So, I mean, are there other types of apps besides web apps? that can benefit from this kind of architecture? Oh God, you, we really could go on and on. So obviously Internet of Things, we're seeing a lot of that happen. So applications which actually bridge across the mobile, having a mobile app, having a device out there, a sensor of some kind, Internet of Things being, and that all being fed back through the cloud. So saw a really cool example the other day, this is a bit scary as well, of uh, the US military are funding drones to be flown by OpenStack. And the reason is, is because if you get drones to fly in a V formation, uh, you only need one pilot for the front one and then they can draft off of each other. So just a you know, really scary and, the, and if the lead one goes down, then one of the second ones can take over? This is it. Well, okay. it's even worse. They're even getting <laughs> tanks to then follow, robot uh, tanks to follow the uh, the flying drones. So I don't want to take this. Th this is the beginning of the end, really, is what, what I'm here to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> Open source brings about the end of, you know, it's Terminator music. Skynet. Dun, dun, you know. dun, so, dun. so let's bring it back into the enterprise a little bit. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm the future guy. You. Because um, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is uh, enterprises that are building their cloud applications really need to take advantage of existing transactional systems. And so what they're doing is they're, you know, they're using an old style of application design using things like message queues and message buses and, uh, and using those as bridges between the old and the new. And so one of the things that OpenStack is, a lot of OpenStack projects have enabled is exposing those services in a natural way through APIs to the new kind of applications, right? So you, yeah. you see these enterprise service buses, and you know, it could be TIBCO, MQ series, whatever the, the legacy thing is, exposed as a service yep. within OpenStack. And look, Morantis would know you guys, are, you're starting bringing in those clients. I must admit, it's, it's been impressive to see the enterprise take off in that space. So you guys are doing great on that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so are there different ways to build those kinds of apps? Oh, God. Well, well, no, right? We agreed that oh, yeah, we, there's PHP. only one way to do it. Yeah, just PHP and, we're, and CSV. We're, and, and, we're, we're, we're and, done. Yeah. One repo. I, I don't know, know of any other way to do it. Yeah, that's it's very simple. Yeah, I mean, of course, there are a bazillion ways, right? So, yeah, there's everything from microservices that are orchestrated with containers with layer three overlay networks that are flexible across very distributed infrastructures down to more traditional tools. You, know, you, can, you can use Python to do this. You can use C++. Uh, you know, it, it really depends on, you know, it, what we see is that it's very important to provide our customers with a journey, right? And that, that journey has to start with where they are today, mm. right? And so figuring out how to bring their existing user base into that, oftentimes that's really about forming a tiger team that is willing to work in a different way, shows evidence of how they can gain benefit yeah. from the cloud and then that becomes like the good kind of cultural virus right yep. where, where people see what kind of what goodness is going on over there how can I get some of that um, and so those kind of small teams working on something new and innovative 
uh, are the place to get started, but how, you know, the next thing is how do you affect yeah. the organization? Oh, and that's essential. I love what you've said there, and it's about the people and processes and having the right group, because the community's having this really big debate right now about, okay, service development kits. If we really want to build something on top, do we want a really tightly constrained, feature-rich service development kit that works with OpenStack Clouds, or do we want to provide these like generic SDKs like LibCloud or JCloud that'll work mm -hmm. across all clouds? And yeah, it's, it doesn't become about the technology at that stage. It's really about actually having a conversation Let's with Let's be clear, the technology is easy. <laughs> I mean, those yeah. problems are solved. Yeah. We, it's really about how they adopt it, how, uh, how those teams communicate it within their own organizations. And surprisingly, the thing that's, uh, anyway, it shouldn't be surprising because through my whole life, I've seen this over and over again, it's about internal marketing, yeah. right? It's about how do the teams that are doing this successfully communicate out and communicate up about what they're doing well and what's not going well and what they need additional resources and support for. Bravo. All app dev, listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you see in the convergence of cloud and containers? Oh, wow. I'll Con let you go first. Yeah, go. <laughs> hey, thank you. Th thanks, I appreciate it. None, again, whatsoever. You know, uh, clouds and containers will probably never, we'll never see them. Look, uh, see the keynote this morning. I think um, I really love what Mark um, is saying about the new LAMP stack in the cloud and all the rest of it, that we need to see OpenStack reach out and be working with these other container communities. It was fantastic to see CoreOS here and Kubernetes. That to me, and well, you could speak a lot more to this because Marantis is doing, I, I keep coming to your developers and being like, hey, what's going on? Tell me the secrets. So yeah, Craig, well, you go into it. Well, it's really interesting to look at what's happening. It's, 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 if you think about the stack, right, you, you have physical separations of, of abstraction. Uh, you know, we've created these logical separations of abstraction uh, in order to really to deal with it organizationally. So if you think about IAS, that's really about who cares about what services and paths, who cares about what services. Um, it, from a technological point of view, those are artificial abstractions, right? They make no sense from the application's perspective whatsoever, and they can become additional layers. So if you think about what's happening with containers and you look at the containerization of the OpenStack infrastructure, you can start looking at the OpenStack infrastructure as a set of services that are just supporting applications. Yeah. And so where things, where we see things heading is that you end up containerizing it all, you have those levels of abstraction that are not fixed, they're represented in a model, mm -hmm. you put that model through your CICD infrastructure, test it, deploy it, and that gives you uh, both flexibility in how you are design your application, but also flexibility in how you deploy, manage, and operate. Right? Yeah. And so you, you, if you do those things together, then, then you get the best of the container world, and you can support legacy applications and VMs and KVM and essentially oh, any hypervisor you want. This is such good news for the enterprise because it, it's actually, it, it is giving that value add, you know, I hate to use these words, mm -hmm. but it's actually bringing that value back into having a private cloud or a hybrid cloud and all the rest of it, so. Right, and, and the, the cool thing for me is it's not like, I mean, you, you keep giving Marantis lots of credit, it's a whole community that's doing this, yeah, right? I mean, CoreOS is participating, Google is participating, yep. you know, you've got uh, a whole variety of, you know, Intel is contributing a ton, We've got a, a rack space as a part of this. It's, it's like everybody's coming together to yeah. make sure that we're solving the problem in a way that will uh, provide the most flexibility and really it's about high velocity of yeah. delivering capability to oh, our customers. Oh, playing upstream. Play upstream. Yeah. That yeah. is the game in all the, in all the communities. Completely agree. Yeah, awesome. Uh, so how important is an app catalog and, and why or why not? Whoa. You want me to take that? Yeah, go for it. All right. Go for it. So. Um, Maybe I can say something we can disagree about. Yeah, let's, yeah let's disagree. <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs> so the catalog, is, uh, the catalog is really about how do people collaborate, right? Across organizational boundaries, even across expertise within an organizational boundary, uh, organization. And so uh, a catalog is just a way to surface some reusable component of code. Yeah. So there are lots of different kinds of catalog. It's a catalog of virtualized network functions, like how do I set up a firewall, or a catalog of building blocks, like how do I connect to uh, a, a NoSQL database, or my, my SQL. Or there's a catalog of higher level services that aggregate those things. And so catalogs are really important because they are that advertisement. And, and when I say catalog, I, want, I mean it in the most general sense. I mean, an API, a CLI, a UI, you really have to 
come to the user however they want to consume this catalog. And so I, I think that in order to get the velocity out of uh, enterprise development shop, you really need to have a catalog that allows people to search and categorize things so they can find the thing at the right layer of abstraction that they want from the applications. And I guess, uh, so I'm not going to disagree here, I, I, unfortunately, because I think the catalog for me, it's not as rich as it needs to be yet, mm -hmm. but the reason why the catalog's really worth watching is because it's starting to show the patterns on how applications are being built. And it's kind of like application developers, they're upstream. Just, we just put up your stuff up in the app catalog yes. because it allows us to then say, oh, we need training around this. This is starting to form as a pattern. Let's get the community together. Let's actually start to, because if we, if this community doesn't talk more to application developers and we don't cross this boundary between DevOps, app developers, sysadmin, we're, the API is not enough. We, no. We've actually got to agree and have human conversations if we're going to see the way that we want application, new applications, the modern application to be developed. I think you said something really important there. It's about patterns. And one of the things that OpenStack is all about is like the APIs and everything. It's all about a pattern of interaction between systems. Yeah. And you know, if, if you think about the catalog, that's about patterns of interaction between, between people and systems, yep. right? And so if you get a, if you put together, not just building blocks, most of what's in the app catalog today is a set of building blocks, but all of those technologies are able to compose additional things. Yep. So the more people contribute patterns and blueprints, the other people can reuse, modify, and improve Big on, up. we're all going to move faster. I'm sorry, we're agreeing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <Damn> well. <laughs> we can try it harder. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let's try We're this one. Disagreeing on this one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure of it. Uh, what app would you like to see on OpenStack? So it's funny, I, I've been, I don't know, I really would like a, um, I've been looking at things like Rocket Chat and Mattermost, so things that are open source versions of Slack. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the reasons I like this is because of the people problem. I keep talking about how do we bridge more people into a conversation, and I want an interface for IRC and mobile and all the rest of it. And mm -hmm. that's what cloud is really powerful. It allows you to have all those interfaces so people can collaborate. So I, I really love apps that are feature rich in that. It's also a reason why I like IoT. You know, this is a bit future spelling, but I love it when you see the mobile part of it, the sensor part of it, the cloud part of it, the, you know, integrated development part of it and all of those interfaces coming together. And why? Because it brings people together and that's what's really cool about applications is, you know, they're they're exciting. Well, that's sense. where our value comes from, right? Yeah. I mean, none of this is any valuable unless any people benefit from it, right? Yeah. So, I think all of that's cool and it's actually uh, better than my answer because your answer talks about the people. The thing for me, the app I want to see is essentially Lambda. In, in OpenStack. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, I'd like to see serverless compute. So as a developer, I want to package up my dependencies and my logic in a simple little in a Docker container and then be able to say, go, go, go do that work. Love it. Right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and that way I don't have to care about a virtual network, I don't have to care about a virtual machine, I don't care where my storage is besides a pointer, right, to, to an S3, and, uh, and, and I'm done. And you know, I, I, that's coming. And uh, oh, this is so cool! El Elbas inside of it, you know, actually making web scale, you know, contain putting putting SQL in my SQL in containers, that then mm -hmm. being able to scale it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that would be having those components, which will build to greater things. Yeah, I think that'll completely revamp what we think is yeah. a twelve-factor app. Yes. Oh, let's yeah. talk about twelve-factor. Oh, no. really? Again? Okay. <laughs> Go for it. No. No, I totally can't. Come to the training. <laughs> yeah. There's plenty of material yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what is the most surprising use of OpenStack that you've seen, or the most surprising app that you've seen on OpenStack? You see a lot more than I do, so I don't know. I'd most surprising? Yeah. Um, I've given my cool, exciting examples. Um, I think the what, to be honest, if I, okay, so let's go a little bit serious. Mm -hmm. Enterprise applications really matter. You know, mm -hmm. I know that everybody hates us to talk about that because we're such a cool developer community and all the rest of it, mm -hmm. but um, the, the things that need to go on there is, and the reason why we're good at this is being able to have applications which work for banking firms, right. which work for people who really, really care about their data and it's got to be secure and there are security people in that company and they want to make sure it works and it's not going anywhere and that it's also web scale and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, 
and again, it goes towards things like every time I see containers in production, I see people putting them in VMs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's because guess what? Security still matters. And let's right. not let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. I love the geeky stuff. I love the future stuff. Mm -hmm. But let's also be serious about some of the you know the security issues that we have. VMs have a very long history behind them that make them secure. And then there are workloads that will be in VMs for as long as Thank we'll you. probably be alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm not pretending the future here. Uh, so, so as far as surprising goes, I, I've seen people do things that some enterprise companies would not like in the cloud. Uh, you know, I, I won't name any names, but you know, violating all kinds of license agreements and things like that. They basically will forklift yeah. their entire legacy infrastructure into KVM, and uh, and that's. That's the most surprising thing I've seen. And, and that, I, I bring that up kind of as a cautionary tale because what ends up happening is you, you do that thinking that you're saving and what happens there is that because of the different kinds of issues you face in this environment, you have to completely revamp your processes, your operational processes to get the same SLA yeah. for your users. And, and, and that just doesn't work. You, you, you really have to think about the application architecture. Um, uh, on, on the other side of that, the most exciting kind of things I've seen are, are really back to the internet of things. Because while you say it's future looking, that's the, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed, right? Uh, there, there are some people that um, I think we'll be able to talk about in the next six months or so who yeah. are doing some IoT applications on OpenStack in a very distributed way and it, it's it's going to change the world. Yeah, it give really me my self-driving car already. That's what I said. I'm so <laughs> tired of driving. Yeah, like, you need, you need you 5G need... first, and then we'll Yeah, okay, we'll get we're there. getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> NFE, 5G, right. containers, yeah, edge networks. Yeah. Close. Very close. Better be in my lifetime. I, I think it will be. Good. Good. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> ah, hold me to it. Put it on Ken. It's all me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're managing the VW account, right? Uh, so, so I, you, yeah, you, personally. You, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. What techniques should application developers learn? I mean, what are they doing wrong? Mm. So, I, I, I think that in general, application developers don't. Yeah. So the, the biggest mistake is the not invented here syndrome, right? Everybody wants to build everything themselves. And so we don't do enough reuse. And that's, this kind of ties back to the notion of catalog. I mean, the internet has changed things amazingly. The fact that I can go to Google and search for a pattern or an application style or tool allows me to find a bunch of tools. And open source is taking that to the next level where I can actually use that code without violating licenses or patents or anything like that in my product or in my service and deliver it, is, it has changed things tremendously. But we still make this mistake as human beings that we want to be the inventor of something without even having tested the other person's attempt at that solution, right? And there's so many of those things where we would all just save if we just contributed to their solution and reused it. And I, I just want to see more of that. Yeah. So again, I'm, it's the people processes thing. I, I see this real division in the community. It's already happened in OpenStack where we have you know, operators versus the, the, mm. the contributors, the developers. Right. And now all of a sudden we have a, a third community here, app dev. And we all know that if you're really going to build an application, you need all these people's skills. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're going to build real web scale cloud applications, mm -hmm. you need a lot of people working with one another. And sometimes I feel like we're doing this splitting thing where we put people on opposite ends of the spectrum and we, so we don't So you're saying really we're making the same mistake that our users are making? So the, you know, if I look at the most successful web scale operators, ones using OpenStack or using other technologies, the, the common theme for all of them is that the developer so supports in production their own code. Exactly. Right? I write a service, <clears throat> me or my team is on the hook to support that. Yep. And if we're separating these teams out and we're saying there's artificial boundaries, you know, I mean, one of the first principles of software development is that your software architecture reflects your organization. Yep. Right? And if we're organizing this way, then we're forcing OpenStack to follow that, and that's probably a mistake. We should yep. rethink that. Yeah, absolutely. Bring community together. Darn, I was hoping you'd disagree. 
Well, look. Oh wait, what was your point? I, I could give you. I could give you something to argue about, which is okay. I, I hate. You know, metaphors are a dangerous thing. So mm -hmm. here's the disclaimer right now. But what I do find interesting is if you look at infrastructure and we go back in history and we look at electricity and stuff like that, the cloud does feel like a power plant at some times. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is as infrastructure matures, you end up getting additional roles, right? Mm -hmm. So we are starting to get additional roles. You know, the architect, there's the brick layer or the the, the engineer or the architect and so forth and mm -hmm. so on. And it feels like we're maturing in those layers. It's it's just mm -hmm. that they haven't been locked down yet. So mm -hmm. it's just really interesting to see as we have these new roles, you know, usability experts now need to be brought into it and all these other you know, roles that come into it. And that to me is really interesting to watch from a, a people. I, I agree, but I think that's more about domains of expertise and experience than about like role of developer. Because like when you talk about software defined infrastructure, at some level, everyone has a development Capability. It's about what is their domain of expertise. That's it. Using those sets of tools. Yeah. So on the subject of uh, uh, general versus specific, um, talk to me about OpenStack specific SDKs versus perhaps general cloud SDKs. I think that we're going to see a massive debate about that. I don't, I, I don't want to drop people. Like my real advice is is get involved in the discussion around this. Right. There's plenty of listservs. There's plenty. Of, <laughs> there's plenty of IRC channels, there's plenty of Slack channels, especially from the app data. <laughs> Literally, Kubernetes has a Slack channel, yep. Mesos has a Slack channel, we've got an IRC channel going out, we've got a listserv. The debate and the discussion, literally there was a there was 100 people in the containers room the other day when we were talking about this, so mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not going to persist that the debate, I'm going to say go join the debate is what I would, I would argue for. Yeah, and my point of view is it ends up being about the use case, <clears throat> right? So what do you need to accomplish for your application, and, you know, and once the, you know, back to my earlier point about it's a bunch. It's it's not layers of the stack that we create artificially. They're tools that deliver applications, and OpenStack is one of those tools, right? And so, what tools do you need when you're, you know, that you're talking about layers of abstraction that essentially focus on portability of application logic across different infrastructures, right? And so, do you need general functions that are going to be in Google Cloud and OpenStack and VMware, mm -hmm. then LibCloud is a great way to go. If you need capabilities that are specialized in some way, then that's not going to be the tool for you. There are other alternatives. And uh, you know, the, the, this comes back to application architecture. You have to figure out in your application where do you de describe the layer of abstraction so that you separate the part that needs that special stuff from the part that doesn't, so that you can change that later on. And that's just basic architecture. Courses for courses. Precisely. Yeah. <laughs> so, that old adage. <laughs> <laughs> so what should around. CIOs be thinking about when it comes to cloud app development? For me, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, the CIO should be focusing on, not on saving money, right? I mean, th th we've had, too many years of people think of OpenStack as a free VMware, yeah, right? right? I mean, that's just that model is not the path to success. Yeah. So what I think the CIO needs to be focusing on is two things. One is how fast can they get new functionality, new applications to their users, so new focus on revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And the other is if I'm caring about OpenStack at all, it's because I have some sort of uh, core expertise in software development that I need to retain and I need to build on. And that's about giving the best possible tools to my developers because that's what retains engineering talent. Giving them things that excite them, that allow them to do new things and be innovative. And so I think the CIO should be worried about how, how do I balance those two things and OpenStack as a venue for enabling that. Yep, yeah, totally agree. It's about building up your team. Uh, making sure you have all those different roles that we've been talking about. You know, it, it, this is at, at the heart of this is if you really want an advantage over your competitor, have better people who can actually build the things that you want. Right. Okay. So um, I, that's it. That's it for me. So I want to thank both of you for taking your time today, and uh, I hope that you have a great rest of the summit. Cool. We Thank didn't you, we didn't say Java or PHP in this whole discussion. Well, we just we managed. To oh, I got him in. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Thanks again, Nick. Thank you cool. very Thank much. You. Cheers, Craig. Thanks, yep. Nick.